Welcome to the Mindfully Masculine Podcast. This is Charles. Okay, in this episode, Dan and I will continue to discuss the five love languages for men, and we're on chapter nine, how can you work through anger together? In this episode, we'll talk about tools and strategies for handling anger in relationships, emotional management, setting boundaries, responding to criticism, taking breaks during arguments, conflict resolution strategies, anger as a motivator, a discussion on some upcoming episodes, and other topics. Please follow or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app, and you can also watch full episodes with audio and video on YouTube. Thanks and enjoy. Good afternoon, Charles. How are you? Hello there. I'm well. Thank you, Dan. How are you? I am great. Any plans for the weekend? Might go to the beach. Yeah, which one? Yeah, Florida? beach tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Clean up the RV a little bit. There's a couple of things, some tidying up I need to do there, and might meet some friends down over by Chase's. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, you. I would go by your the office and see if they've got some local RV guy who lives there and works there, and see what's going on with your lights. Because again, the right side never ended up. Oh, about the light never looked yeah, as thank bright you. as the other side, and that's probably a fuse or something fairly easy that he can somebody yeah. can fix. My, for you. my oven isn't working either inside. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah, is your is that burners all, are working? Is it electrical or gas? Gas. Oh, weird. Yeah. Huh. It's, so there's something that's not. Yeah. Connecting whatever, but the burners on top work. So I don't know. That is interesting. I yeah. wonder, yeah, it must be a connection. I'd be careful about that because it could be leaking propane. Yeah. So uh, that's- I didn't smell anything. Is propane a smellable one? Yeah. It is? Oh, okay. Yeah. I always forget which, yeah. which gases you can smell, which yeah. one you can't. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's jump back in. So congratulations to our listeners who don't like the banter. We're going to keep that to a minimum this episode. You are welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, secretly, I hate you because I think the banter is the best part. But we'll try to help you with your problems anyway. We're going to talk about chapter nine of five love languages for men is all about anger and how to work through anger and keeping in mind that, yeah, anger, the mishandling of anger is a real source of, a source of difficulty, a source of arguments, a source of breakups and coming up with a strategy for how you handle being angry is one of the most important things I think you can do if you want your relationships to go well. So we'll talk tools, we'll talk strategies, and we'll talk encouragement. And one of the opening stories about a couple in this chapter is a guy who basically says, I don't remember ever losing my temper before I got married. And I can relate to that a little bit where it's and in certain relationships, certain girls that I dated, certain partners I've had, it's like some of them was like, we never really had much conflict at all. And I, did, I don't remember experiencing anger at all. And some others, I just felt, man, I'm walking around angry nonstop in this relationship. And uh, yeah, it's certain people will activate that in you more than others. Yeah. But in any case, it's, it's always your responsibility to, to handle it in healthy and beneficial ways. And again, just not live on autopilot and just do what you feel like doing in the. Yeah. I think it's really dangerous if you've ever felt anger before, because then you haven't had the practice to manage it properly. Yeah. And you definitely haven't thought about putting some tools or some sort of parameters in place to help you deal with it. Because yeah, when we're in the moment, when emotions are running hot, our brain gets shut off. Like a lot of times our, the brain that makes good decisions, mm -hmm. uh, that part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex gets shut off because we're operating on pure emotions. Yeah. What they call the lizard brain. Right. So I think it, this is good in almost in any respect to the same, anytime you're feeling a lot of emotions, putting some sort of parameters in place to help you make the decisions that you want to make, basically manage your emotions properly, whether that's love or anger here. That's true. I think it's, it's really important. So he goes through some of these tools and, and methods in this chapter. And as we talk so often when it comes to good habits, the best tool that you're going to have is your sense of identity of who you are. And in that you get to say to yourself, okay, it's not just a matter of telling yourself this. It's also a matter of practicing it and making it a disciplined habit to say, there are certain things I do not do or I do not say, regardless of the situation, regardless of who I'm dealing with, regardless of how I'm being triggered, I simply do not do X, Y, and Z. And mm -hmm. that could be, I am not a person that raises my voice and yells at other people. I am not a person that hits other people. I am not a person that punches holes in the drywall. And when you make that decision of this is not who I am, 
and you reinforce that with your behavior over years and decades, then yeah, when something really rough happens to you, you get to fall back on that identity of, look, I, I am not someone that starts violent altercations. I'm not someone that punches holes in the wall. I am just not somebody who does that. And so you effectively are able to take those maladaptive practices off the table because you built a, an identity where you're just not somebody who does that. Like, mm -hmm. When I get cut off in traffic, I'm not a guy who gets out of my car and goes and knocks on a window. I, All right. There's no way that someone could cut me off in traffic today that would change me into the person that does that because that's just not who I am. And learning to develop that around the anger you have in your close relationships is something you can do. And, and you can refine that and get better and better at it and more and more detailed to the point where you're like, I am not somebody who relitigates arguments from the past when I get angry. There's a big difference between that and say, I'm not somebody who hits my wife when we get into a fight. Yeah. You start with the big one and then over time and with discipline and with practice, you can get that narrowed down and narrowed down to the point where you're somebody who like, you, you can make a list of all the things I don't do when I'm angry. Even if it immediately occurs to me to do this thing, I just not the guy that does that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just a matter of saying it, it's a matter of saying it and practicing it. And even giving yourself a little bit of a pat on the back when you do get activated and you choose not to do those things, you get to say, look, you're regardless of what this fight was about, regardless of what the outcome of the fight was good for you for sticking to being who you are and who you want to be. Yeah. And that's very important because for a lot of us, when does anger happen? What is it that causes us to be angry? And in my case, it's either I feel like I might be denied something that I need or I might be given something that I don't want and don't believe I can handle. It's usually a matter of either you're taking something from me or you're refusing to give me something that I need. And that makes me angry. That makes me feel like I'll be treated unfairly or my survival's at risk or whatever. And in many of those cases, that's not true. It's just what the lizard part of my brain is telling me, like mm -hmm. not getting what you need or something that you do need is being withheld from you or you're being refused something that you deserve and man, I'm angry about that. For the most part, it's usually not as bad as we feel like it is. And we can talk ourselves into recognizing that truth. Yeah. One of the things he, he gets into is a couple here where he says sometimes the wife would tilt her head in a certain way and stare at him. And he said, that look is worse than a thousand condemning words. What I see in her eyes is I'm sorry, I married you. Yeah. And he talks about it's a disrespect type of, and that, that is triggering for me with anger is that belittling or disrespect type of thing. And that's very difficult for me to, oh, for to not her. react. How do you get, to, how do you not get defensive? If your partner yeah. gives you a look or, or says something to you where you have, you are interpreted based on either your choice in the moment or your life experience, you're, you're taking that as. I'm better than you and we both know it. And to like, me, oh geez. To me, that's the beginning of a resentment that Oh, for sure. Not that I resent them, but that I'm feeling they resent me. Yeah. Because exactly. they don't respect me and now I'm a burden to them, if anything, right? And right. so now I'm And how can your future be secure and, and you're a burden to them? And it's very difficult for me not to go, You resent me, I'm gonna resent you. Or just cut or just the, the emotions of a similar type of mirroring of type of feeling absolutely triggers up on that. And when I was younger, that absolutely was the case. As I've gotten older, I realize a lot of times the way people communicate, in, especially in a way where it's negatively towards me or in a stressed way, it may not have anything to do with me. They could have had a bad experience recently. They could be not feeling well. They could be stressed about something that they just haven't communicated to me. So my brain to break up the immediate negative reaction that I might have I try to find a question to ask. I try to just say, hey, what else could have caused this person to, because normally this person doesn't act this way. To, right. What could be going on in the situation? And so just by pausing and just finding some question to ask, whatever that might be, is enough sometimes for me to just interrupt all of the feelings that are building up at, the, at that point, or at least slow them down a right. little bit and, and give me some time to think through the situation. Yeah, I like that. And uh, I think that'll be one of the six keys that we cover in this in this chapter. And you and I have talked before about the importance of realistic affirmations and telling yourself things about yourself or the situations that you're in that you believe enough to leave open some room for growth. And one of those could be, you know, when you're having an argument with your partner, 
you can tell yourself, I am 99% sure that she is only doing this to hurt me and get under my skin and make me angry. And even if you can just say 99% sure, that will leave you that one little bit to say, there's still a chance. <laughs> yeah. It's all that one in a million talk. That little chance to say, maybe I don't get, I don't have all the information that I need before I act. And if you can tell yourself, maybe I don't have all the information that I need before I make, before I act on the way I'm feeling, that can sometimes open to a very wide door of lots of good decisions that you can make. Mm -hmm. But if you react to stuff in a way where it's, I'm a hundred percent sure that she's doing this just to get under my skin and hurt me. It's, okay. If you're hundred percent sure, then time to get the nuclear bombs out because you're hundred percent sure. And so few of us are ever or should ever be a hundred percent sure of anything in our mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. And we should always leave some of that room open to, okay, I might need some more information before I choose to act. And that's very important. One of the things he does talk about, which is something I certainly have experienced is our spouses or our partners will also often try to criticize our behavior. And when they see us starting to lose our minds and go crazy, they'll point out, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just criticizing the way you behaved or the way you handled this. And in my case, I immediately go to, but I am my behavior. Who I am is what I do, what I do, what I think, what I feel, what I say, that is who I am. And if you're criticizing my behavior on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, whatever, whatever frequency it is, when it happens frequently enough, it's like, I can't separate my identity from the things that I do that get under your skin all the time. Yeah. And, and, and that's where we as partners also need to keep in mind of I, I don't think it's our job to shut up and take it when our partner's doing something that either doesn't meet our needs or triggers us. But we also do have to choose our battles and understand who we're in a relationship with. And when there are things about your partner's personality that are, it's who they are, and on a daily basis that is bothering you or triggering you in some way, you have to make this decision of, okay, is this worth me bringing up and trying to get changed? Or is this something is a responsibility on me to decide I can live with this or I can't live with this because yeah, there will be things about your partner, whether it's little quirks or idiosyncrasies or values that they have that you're unlikely to just say, Hey, could you please change this? And then say, yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And then they actually do because people are who they are and we have a great capacity to change things about ourselves, but we also have a limited capacity to change things about ourselves. So it's tough to know where that is. Yeah. I think when people say, hey, I'm criticizing your behavior, not who you are, I think it really means I believe you can change if you want to. Not that you're stuck That's making true. that yeah. decision, but at the maybe, time- Maybe they're not. But at the time, you were making the best decision that you thought possible. And so I agree with you, your behavior is who you are. And yeah. at that time it was, right? I think- if you are on the receiving end of that criticism, I think it's important to realize, hey, yeah, this is something that I could change about myself, but this is what I thought at the best time. And hey, do I think that I should have changed or done things differently, right? Or would I still do things the way I did them initially? Yeah. And that, that is it caused the issue. That's a hard question to ask yourself. And it's a very hard question to answer because very few of us walk around with this very clear line between what is my personality versus what is my behavior and what are the things about my behavior that I can alter, modify, maybe smooth over a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what are the things that it's just, no, I can't. I just can't, I can't change. Like there, there's some things about me with a former partner. I love talking about what's in the news, particularly when it's something of a political or sociological nature. And I like getting into it. I like making my opinions known. I like hearing other people's opinions. And I like seeing where we agree, where we disagree. And if you're with somebody where that more often than not leads to a fight, then you've got to decide, okay, is it worth it to continue banging my head against this brick wall? Or should I say, okay, I still want to have these conversations with my partner, but I need to approach them in a new way, or I need to find other friends outside of my primary romantic relationship where I can unscrew this valve and get to experience this with somebody who can roll with the punches. And even when things get a little heated or a little rough, 
they can still be my buddy after the conversation's over. Yeah. And if you're like, well, no, I need, I need that in a romantic partner, then it's okay. Then it's your turn to say to them, Hey, I have this need. Is this something that you think you can modify some of your behavior to help me? Or is this just, no, the way you're currently bringing this to me, there's not a way that I can handle not getting triggered by it. We either, you need to change something on your end or not bring it up to me because I can't change anything on my end. Yeah. And those are hard conversations to have. Because it's hard to frame things in the way of, this is something I need from you without the, and if I can't do it, then what? Right. Because there's, yeah. that, un, there's that unsaid, whenever you say, I have this need or I have this boundary, the other person, if they get activated and if they start getting fearful about losing the connection or losing the life that they see themselves having, yeah, it's and, and I've been there before where it's, okay, you're telling me you need this. And now my mind Im immediately goes to, and if you don't get it from me, then what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to leave me? You're going to break up with me? You're going to tell me that you don't want to have my children? Okay. So you're telling me you have this boundary. Don't leave it open. Tell me the or else. Because yeah. that's the thing. Whenever you set a boundary for somebody, there is usually an unspoken or else attached to the boundary. Or it's not a boundary. Correct. There needs to be consequences. Yeah. And one of the things when you feel attacked, when somebody, when you're not used to having boundaries set in your life, yeah, then you're going to feel somewhat attacked and you're going to go straight to, okay, you're setting an ultimatum. What's the ultimatum? Tell me, give me the or else. If I don't do this, then what, what are you going to do? Because you feel like somebody is potentially pulling something away from you that you think you need. And most of us get defensive when that happens. So knock it off. Dang. Yeah, that's really tough. That's where I feel like having a, a third party, like a oh, Louise, yeah. couples counselor. Yes, absolutely. Helpful. Yes. With that. And I think if anything to, hopefully it never gets to the point of where it is so contentious that somebody's going to be like, or what are you going to do about it? Versus I'm not really comfortable doing those things that you're asking me to do. Is there a way that I love you? I want to try to make this work. I need to figure out how to get comfortable with this. I feel like a good partner would be like willing to at least explore some options and want to try to get. And I think though, if they're not willing to try to get there, then that what you were just that scenario you're just talking about or else that comes into play immediately. If somebody's not willing to work with you on something that is a, a boundary yeah. for you, then you're not with the right person. And I've, you been, know? I, I've been that not right person before. I've been yeah. that domineering yeah. immediately. Okay, you're going to try to set a boundary with me. I want to take this all the way to the logical c conclusion and see what is it that you're really saying here? How are you trying to control my behavior? How are you trying to change who I am? And no, that's not the way so, that you're supposed but, to handle this, but I've put myself in that position before. And that's where it's a whole, I think, art form in and of itself, setting boundaries versus setting preferences, right? So I think there's a lot of nuance there where I want things to be this way versus this. it's this way or the highway type of thing. Or if you're not going to meet my preferences, it's the highway too. And it's Yeah, learning where what your non-negotiables are is really something you can really only do on your own or with your own therapist or counselor or whatever, where you have to come up with that list of, look, these are the things, these are the preferences, these are the boundaries. This is what I'm, what I'd rather not accept, but I'm willing to accept versus these are the things that I absolutely I would, not accept. I would love for us to do a book on boundaries because I need to get better at that too. Okay. Yeah. And I think maybe we should try and find one on setting boundaries and enforcing boundaries and stuff. Yeah. yeah I read a couple. Okay. We'll revisit Great. and see what ones do that. are uh, available on uh, Audible because as I told you the other day, I'm, I refuse to take on books that do not have an audio component. I am happy I'm on the same page for sure. Audible. Yeah, just this morning on the drive over, I re-listened to these two chapters that we did today. And if I was forced to just sit down and open a book, like that's self-care for men, that was what we had to do. And yeah, the ability to prepare was definitely impacted by not having an audio copy. So yeah, yeah, we can do boundaries. I'll try to find one that's relatively simple, relatively short, so that we don't find ourselves mired in a book about boundaries for six months. Yeah. But I like that idea. That's a good idea. Cool. Because, and ideally we'll find one that covers not only how to set boundaries with people, but how to accept other people's boundaries when they set them with you. Oh, absolutely. And, and not feel. That's probably the most important and part. And not feel attacked when somebody sets a boundary, you know, that because a, a well thought out and set boundary is good for both people in the relationship. Uh, not just for, it's not a win-lose, it's a win. Yeah. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll explore that. That's a good idea. Okay. So. One thing he does say is that love and uncontrolled anger cannot coexist in a relationship. And I agree with that a hundred percent. If you don't 
adopt strategies for how to experience and respond to the anger that wells up inside you, then you're either going to be in a constant state of blowing up over potentially small things or misunderstandings, or you're going to be in a position where you just try to bury the anger deep down and the end result is still the same. It, it, it leads to blowups. It's just a matter of, are you going to have big infrequent blowups or are you going to have little frequent blowups? And neither of those will contribute to the kind of relationship that you probably want to have. So he gives us some keys to anger management that I'd like to go through and just touch on each of them as six steps. First is acknowledge the reality of anger, which is what I was just talking about, which you can't, you can't pretend that you don't get angry. You can't pretend that you're above feelings of anger. And you also can't pretend that every time you get angry, you're completely right and justified in doing so. There are going to be times, maybe even the majority of times that you get angry over things that your conscious, rational mind, looking back a week from now, a month from now, would say, oh, Charles, you don't have any right to get angry about that. You had a right to feel anger, but you didn't have a right to act on those anger feelings because you were wrong about what you thought was going on. Because you didn't get that information up front. Well, you, it took that it, time to actually feel that. He mentions the two definitions here. Yes, I like those. Yeah, definitive, where somebody's actually done the wrong action or distorted, right? Which is basically based on a misunderstanding. Did you ever watch Three's Company? As oh, well? yeah. I remember that? Yeah, it was. That was that every was, episode was a misunderstanding about something. Absolutely. That was, that was like the, the pinnacle of every single one. It was just some weird coincidence that, right. that happened. And it was, misunderstanding is where the, the drama came from. But it was a really popular show for a while. That must speak to us at some level, that idea of, oh, I saw something. I didn't have all the information. I concluded it and, was one thing. And I reacted to it based on my assumptions. And then at the end, I was proven that my, my assumptions were proven incorrect. And then now I've got egg on my face. Every, yeah. Now I'm embarrassed, but everybody kisses and makes up at the end of the episode. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so that's definitely at the Regal Beagle. At the Regal. <laughs> With Larry. <laughs> With Larry. Oh my God. And Larry did like his leisure suits. Oh, he did. That was definitely a leisure suit, Larry. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, just know that you're going to experience both kinds of anger. Your partner is going to do things. Probably not deliberately, but regardless, they're going to be actual concrete reasons for you to be angry about something because either they made a choice that led to your need not being met, they didn't consider your feelings, they, yeah, some, something actually happened where you have a reason to be angry about it. And I would even say if somebody does something deliberately, there's a reason behind it that you don't know. Oh, absolutely. Especially if you were in a, a wonderful, loving relationship with somebody or even even for a short period of time, and then somebody does something really deliberately to piss you off, there's usually some sort of reason behind it. Yeah. And even then, try not to react initially and with it go blowing up, start thinking, ask some questions. Hey, what could have happened here? You know, get curious. Yeah. Look, I mean, you and I discussed that a couple episodes ago about... um you as a kid either being whiny or manipulative because you wanted a treat or you wanted a toy or something like that. And my argument to you was, even if you're doing it because you're being manipulative and whiny to get what you want, there's still a reason mm -hmm. that you feel it's necessary to implement that behavior to get your need met. Right. And that's yeah. a perfect example. So even when somebody is behaving in a way that you have a moral issue with, or you think, oh, this is displaying a character flaw. It's, yeah. But underneath the surface, they're relating to you in the way they feel that they have to, or else their need is not going to get met. Always be willing to open it up and dig a little deeper to try to figure out what's going on. Because on the surface, yeah, it's, oh, you're being petty or bitchy or whatever. But it's like, why is it that you feel like your only recourse is to behave in a way that I'm going to perceive as petty or bitchy or whatever? There's something going on under the surface yeah. every time. And that's the thing is, if you're not going to dig in a little bit and look for that root cause analysis, right? Which I have Which talked always the hardest part of the, of closing the case. Yeah, right? absolutely. Right. But if you can find out what that is, then your success for the future or the success is a lot more likely to happen in terms of that person not behaving that way in the future, right? Versus right. just the initial reaction or the initial uh, response to put a bandaid over it or just deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might think, make things a little bit better immediately, but uh, it's, yeah, you're sweeping something under the rug here. Right. And we should not judge ourselves or others on what they feel, but on what they say and do. 
because there is no, there are not emotions or reactions that people experience while they're still in somebody's head. They're not inherently wrong. And it's only when people act on their emotions that we get to say, okay, now you're intruding on the health and safety of my own life. So if somebody gets angry at you for something, but they don't act on that anger and they calibrate their reaction before they act, then they haven't done anything wrong to you. Mm -hmm. And if somebody has not done anything wrong to you, but they come to you and say, Hey, when you did this, it made me angry. I would say you don't get to respond in kind with angry actions of your own. At least you should try not to, because that is an unbalanced response. If, if somebody says, Hey, you did this thing. I felt angry for a while, but then I decided you and I should have a conversation about it. And your response to that is to fly off the handle and be like, how could you get angry at me over that? Then you've just done something wrong against your partner that they took the time and effort not to do to you. That's not okay. No, and you're basically negatively reinforcing exactly. the bad behavior or you're reinforcing bad behavior exactly. at that point because you're punishing the what you want, right. if you, is it, which is you want that information. If your partner sees that and says, okay, if I take the time to regulate my own emotions and come to you calmly, I still have to deal with your blow up. Why don't we just go straight to the blow up? Yeah. I've made an effort since we've been getting into some of these personal development books, whenever I've had uh, some criticism from partner, my current partner, actually, I have the first thing I've done is thanked her for communicating that with me. Wow. And that's not been easy. I've had to take a couple of deep breaths, but by doing that, I actually then get more information from her about the situation and she doesn't feel like she's at risk of making me angry because now it's not a, an environment where she feels like she can be more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. She's already coming to me being vulnerable, saying, hey, did something wrong here and, and it's bothering me type of yeah. thing. And so I really, and that's worked well. Only every single time it's worked well. And if anything, it's also ended up resolving, a lot of times resolving the issue without, and I don't know if this is good, but without me having to do much. Sometimes it was just her needing to just express to me what was going on. And then it's, it doesn't come up again and it's dropped and it's, it's a little bit of a new world for me. I'll be honest with you, but, I, but, but I'm really, it's, it's, I'm really seeing the benefits of just trying to encourage the communication. Yeah. Think about number one, even if you're with a girl and it's her first romantic relationship ever, she's probably still already experienced a man who was not able to handle criticism, whether that was her father, her brother, her uncle, mm -hmm. whatever. So that we all have people in our lives that, 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 that can't uh, handle criticism. Especially, but when somebody flies off the handle at criticism and they outweigh you by a hundred pounds and could snap your neck, that it probably does feel even a little bit more threatening to, to have to put yourself oh. into that situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, and yeah, every girl that comes to you with a concern has probably had a guy react to her coming with a, coming to them with a concern in an unfavorable way. Yeah. Now she probably hasn't ended up in the hospital, but there's been probably something that has made her feel like, oh, geez, that makes me feel uncomfortable or unsafe. And maybe I'm better off not bringing this to somebody. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. But the other thing is, yeah, if you do something to your or in your relationship with your partner where maybe she has some of that distorted anger where she feels like, I feel a little bit unseen or unheard and I'm going to, I'm going to bring this to Dan, then you drilling down for more information is the only thing you could do that would say yeah. you were unseen or unheard. And I'll go a step further and show you that you're not being unseen or unheard right now. You yeah. tell me more about how you felt. Tell me more about what happened. Well, in all fairness, at the time, she, I may not have seen. And so, okay, yeah. And, but yeah, whether I don't know. Really admit, yeah, so maybe it's a lot of times maybe, that is the case. And the reason why I'm saying this is because a lot of times that is the case. I'm just not, I'm the, I didn't pay attention. I didn't notice her reaction to a situation. Okay, so in this case, and, uh, whether it's yeah. definitive or distorted, the answer is still the same, which is be open to to drill down for more information. For me, it's just lack of awareness. So, so many times I'm, I'm like, I'm not going through the day where, you know, like on autopilot, I think a lot of us do that, right? So I think I've read something about like 70% of our day is spent on autopilot. So there's a lot of times where I'm not picking up on things right. and noticing little things. That's not my attention. I've just realized that that there's nothing wrong with me because I do that, right? It's not that it, or that I don't care or I'm a bad person. It's, yeah, I, I had a busy day or I was tired or whatever that is. And I was not paying attention. If somebody's going to point out something out where 
I could have done something better or differently, I'm going to encourage that. And so I'm going to just thank them for that and, and say, hey, tell me more. Absolutely. Please let me know. And it doesn't feel like I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I'm and hearing all this criticism and feeling great about myself. Mm -hmm. I am not. But I also know that long term, it's going to lead to more information about myself, more information about her. And it's going to it's going to definitely build uh, a connection and, and foster a stronger connection because I'll be aware of it for next time. And yeah. And, and there's nothing manipulative about rewarding what you want repeated. That is just how. That is how conscious creatures from how your, all that's, humans and animals you know, work. Yeah, absolutely. Your behavior is rewarded, then you're more likely to repeat it. And that's a form of communication. Yeah. As well. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And you don't have to play any games. You can say, you can tell your partner that's what you're doing. Hey, I really appreciate that you did this. I want to encourage you to do this again in the future because I think it works for both of us. And just be completely honest with, I'm rewarding your behavior because I would love to see this repeated. And they would probably be like, I want to feel safe to repeat this behavior and I'd like you to do the same. And then you get into a positive feedback loop instead of a negative one. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing, and this is something I felt he could go, he could have gone into a little bit more detail on step two or the second key is agree to acknowledge your anger to each other, which is be ready to say, Hey, when you said this or did this, my immediate reaction was to get angry. Here's a problem. A lot of us fellows are walking around without the ability to know what we're feeling in the moment. Like I, I realize I feel not good right now, but I can't even put as imprecise a label on it as I'm angry. It's just, I feel, or I feel, and that's sometimes that's all that, that's the only message that our nervous system is giving to our own, the front of our brain yep. it's, it's just, I don't feel good about this right. and we can't, we don't have the ability to to go any more specific than yeah, that. Yeah, I think the labeling comes from the front, the front, the more modern brain. And sometimes those go, that goes offline when our right. emotions are going through the roof. So you're right. It's, yeah. The only way to define it is the kind of grunt that we're making almost, right? Yeah. And uh, one of the things I think I heard Brene Brown talk about was to almost have a mantra that you're willing to say to yourself in those situations where either when you're feeling bad, either say unsafe, unsafe attack mm. or something like that. Because when you start conceptualizing words, that brings in the front part of your brain. Yeah, makes sense. That brings it into the discussion. So we start feeling that way. Okay, something's going on here where I'm I'm feeling either under attack or angry, upset, scared, whatever it is. Just engage the part of your brain that makes words and you'll be able to access more parts of that. And again, I highly recommend the book Permission to Feel where that that gives you some strategies to be able to say, okay, here's how I can start very broad and narrow in exactly on, on what it is that I'm feeling. And that once, once you can label what you're experiencing, then you have some control to do something about it. But when you don't, when you're walking around and you're angry as hell and you don't even know that you're angry yeah, and that's when you're, like you said, on autopilot, you're just reacting. It tossed around the waves. Yeah. I think for me, uh, logically, I think what would work best for me is to use the part of your brain that is the most active at the time. So that's our lizard brain. So for me, that means doing something physical to try to get rid of the emotions or lessen the emotions. So whether that's deep breathing, going for a walk, doing something physically active to get some of that energy out. Another option is a great book that I read years ago, and I just was reintroduced to it, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. She talks about anytime you're feeling anything off, count the five, five, four, three, two, one. And that also can help change the thoughts in your brain. She talks about it also for anxiety and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. Before you give a talk, before you go talk to somebody that is, is important, you don't engage the front part of your brain. You just say five, four, three, two, one, and you go and you do it. And so- that might be another book we could we could look at down the road, but yeah. a, lot of, a lot of really great, simple. I've not read any of her stuff before, tools that I follow her on social media, and she posts a lot of good content. Oh, That's great. One of the things I think is Dr. Julie talks about in as a strategy for mitigating anxiety, I believe, is the is like the four corner or the squared breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like and anywhere you are, you can almost put your eyes on something that is square, or rectangular in shape. Engaging all that physical, that's another great yes. technique. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I use that one fairly frequently when I'm feeling anxious or confused or just not like I'm ready to react to something at my best. Then just 
tracing that line and it, it helps somehow it helps. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely recommend that. Oh, Dr. Julie announced yesterday on social media, she has breast cancer. Oh no. Yeah. And she, she, uh, she doesn't share a lot of personal stuff on her social media, but she did, she did share that it's, I believe early stage. And she said there's some statistics she cited that most people, when they are screening themselves and they realize that there's a problem, wait three months before they actually go to a healthcare provider. After they found something problematic, they wait all this time before they actually do well, anything about it. I think it makes sense. People know maybe wrong about it. Yeah. And yeah, she shared it in an effort to encourage people that number one, screen yourself. And number two, when you see something of immediately. concern, immediately go address it. I wish you heard the best because she's one of my favorite people. Certainly my, my favorite oh, author that we've covered on this show. For sure. And uh, yeah, I hope everything works out with her. But yeah, if you haven't read Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before, it's pr we said on a, not too long ago, it's the only book we've done on this show that I have not had some beef with. It's a wonderful, it's like a toolbox. It really is. It's just. It's a flawless one too. Yeah. Like I, I cannot pick out stuff. Effective, short, succinct, pointed. Yeah. Great, great. I, yeah, real world strategies, not a bunch of I, theory. I bought six of them for Christmas and gave them out to friends and family. So one of the best books I've ever read. I'm happy that uh, it came to me through a, a former partner. That's how I found out about it. And then I pass it off to you and yeah, we're well. evangelizing everybody into Dr. Julie. And I believe, I believe she also mentioned that video. She's got a second book that's going to come out soon. Excellent. Yeah. So I'll be in line to buy that. Sure. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The key here is be okay with someone whether that's yourself or someone else saying, I felt angry about this because if your partner comes to you with a, I felt angry about this and your immediate reaction is something negative, then you're teaching her that it's not okay to tell you that she's angry. And when it's not okay to tell you that she's angry, she's, that's not going to stop her from feeling or getting angry. All that's going to stop her from doing is telling you about it. Something that might help is when somebody comes to you and says that, try to remember that it may not all be your fault. There's other things going on in the world, That's her world, that that may have, and even if she thinks it's all your fault, that might not also be the truth. Just realize that if somebody tells you that they're angry about something, you got to play detective. Put on your hat and figure out, get more information about the situation from her, everything else, and it may not be your fault. And don't just assume that it is. And that just it, it, that's just as much of a mistake to make as it is to to assume you know what happened, right? You're basically saying you know what happened if you're going to assume it's your fault. Mm -hmm. So you can't possibly know that it's your fault or all your fault anyway because you don't know exactly what happened until you get more information. I don't know if that helps at all, but it helps me. That is that is one of the hardest things for me to do. And if there's anybody out there who operates like me, first of all, condolences. Second, it is just, yeah, I... The mix of my biology, my childhood experiences, mm -hmm. fill in the blank, whatever it is that it is, a lot of the time I only feel safe when I feel like I'm in complete control. Yeah. And sure. I'm only in complete control if everything that happens in the world is my fault or my, it's either, if it's good, it happened because of, of so my, did. Something, my positive effort. If it's bad, it happened because it's all my fault and I'm the one that made it happen. Yeah. And so to look at it in that context of, yeah, the thing that she's bringing to me that led to her anger might not be my fault. Or might not be all your I'm going to throw at you what you've said a lot of times, which is take responsibility for your actions, but only take as much as is appropriate, right? You, and I've heard you say that time and time again. So you got to remember that it's, it, you are human like the rest of us, and that applies to you too. Yeah. I'm working on that. that yeah. That is not... An, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on too in this chapter, I believe. Yeah. That is a, that is an intellectual truth that I stand by. But yeah. to feel it is yeah. different. Feel it and have it connected to your in the moment actions is, that's where the work is. Like yeah, yeah. learning and believing the things that are true that make you a healthier person. That's the easy part. It's the connecting that to the emotions that you feel and then letting that influence your actions yeah. in real time. Yeah. That, that's where the hard work is. For me, what helps I found is when I have a daily practice of reflection of the things I did that day, that is what helps me with that specifically realizing, hey, like I didn't completely waste this day. Yeah, I did all these things. Or when this thing happened, oh, you know what? 
yeah, I'm partially to blame here, but I also, after 24 hours or whatever that time period is, I see now the other things that were at play that I just was not, had, I did, had no control over type of thing. And that's for me, that hard concrete evidence to say, or show me that I did do my best, or maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't do my best. Maybe I could have done something differently or better, but at least that is a little bit more of an accurate perspective of what happened for me. And it's, it settles me down before bed. Yeah, that I, I can see how that's helpful. I, I'm so bad at creating habits or rituals that require me to do something at the end of the day when I'm when my willpower is tapped. It's tough for me too. It, it really is. Like yeah. I can make a list of a dozen things I want to do every morning and for the most part I could do them all. Yeah. But man, when I have to try to create a, a nighttime habit, those are so hard for me. What's helped me is move that thing that's difficult up time wise. So I used to try to do it like right before bed at eight thirty, nine o'clock, mm. nine thirty didn't happen. Okay. And so then I started to do it. Okay. I'll do it right after dinner. Didn't happen. So now I'm doing it as soon as my, I'm done with the day for work, gotcha. my IT stuff, I go and I do it there before I even have dinner. And I sit and I journal yet the day's, the whole day's not done yet, but it's better than not getting it done right. at all. So the huge happens to you at night. You can put it on the, the next day. If I have to, but that's the thing is it's just, it gives me that little, that micro dose more of energy I've got by doing it at six or six thirty rather than seven thirty, eight o'clock at night, I'm still willing to sit there and, and do it. So interesting. Yeah. I'll I'll have to take that into account and see if some of my nighttime rituals that I'm I'm having I'm doing a, a poor job of of getting these just levels. If, if there's a way you can move it up in time, just I'm curious. Yeah, let me know. I'm, I'm curious if that helps. All right. Key number three, agree that verbal or physical explosions that attack the other person are not appropriate responses to anger. And that's, yeah, that's a conversation that has to be had because you may assume that you, you might come into your relationship with the idea of having a heated argument where you yell at each other. That's fine. As long as I'm not hitting you where your partner may feel like even a raised voice is not okay. That feels what drove I'm in a date interrupt position. You. What drove me nuts is I've had previous relationships where I know I'm not raising my voice, but then I'd be accused of raising my voice. And then that would end up raising my voice because I'm like, it's not what, like, I know I was you know talking in a calm way and it was just like, and it was what I was saying, not how I was saying it, but she's like, well, what you're, you're raising me. And it was just. Yeah, I'll bet I've been on the other you know, side of that too, where I've probably accused somebody of raising their voice when they actually weren't. And it was just I think it was just they were I mean, like the decibel level of their voice may not have gone up, but the emotion in their the voice tone maybe, oh, the emotion was yeah. making me uncomfortable. Yep. It was stop raising your voice at me. I'm not raising my voice. And then I probably put them in the same position where they started raising their voice because they were being falsely accused of it. So yeah, I've been on both sides of that one. Yeah. For me, I think one of one of my triggers is when I feel like I can't communicate or they're not open to hearing mm. my side of things. So yeah. that is shutting me down by saying, don't raise your voice at me, even when I'm not. It's like, how am I? I can, yeah. Now I can't communicate at all because I know I'm not right. raising my voice. So now you're just shutting it down. Yeah. And I and that's hard for me. That, that, that's been hard for me to deal with. I've been on both sides of that too. I've, I've done it myself. And, and I've had it done to me where I'm not comfortable with the, with the real topic of what we're fighting about. Oh, so I'm going to attack the way that you're fighting. Yes. And then I, okay. I've I can, been there too. Okay. I yeah. can move the discussion off of the thing I'm not comfortable with to criticizing the way that you brought it up to me or the way that you're talking about it. And now we can have a whole set. We can have a whole second fight. That's also miserable, but it's about something that I'm more comfortable arguing about than the first thing. And I think that's actually worse because now, or like you're almost attacking their identity in terms of oh, and the way they're communicating and now you're a bad person. And every back and forth moves you further oh. away from the core issue too. Yeah. I've wasted so much time doing that. Yes. A hundred percent. Malarkey. It's the worst. And, but yeah, it, when you're in a conversation that you're fundamentally uncomfortable with, you will do anything that you can to move away from that. And that includes, let's fight about this other thing instead. Yeah. And for me, it was usually immediately assuming that I'm in the, that's usually what gets, gets me to that level where I get super defensive and say, right, like you're just scrambling to find anything else to talk about. Yep. Because you're not going to win this conversation. You're not going to, it's not going to come out in favor for you. Yeah. So that's what's happened to me. So what he does here, and I've said this before, I feel like one of the one of the skills that I think would have probably most positively impacted my most recent formal relationship was the ability to take breaks in the middle of argument. For sure. And yeah. God, it, 
it feels impossible for me to do that, man. It is so hard. And one thing I'd like your perspective on, because one of, one of the rules that my, my ex and I both agreed to was, okay, sometimes one of us would feel the need to call for a break in the argument, which good thing that should be done hundred percent. But in my case, I didn't feel at the time, like I had the ability to say, Hey, I'm feeling like I'm triggered right now. I, I think we should take a break and discuss this later. Instead of that, I would just leave and slam the door. Mm. And based on what he says about this, I kind of get the impression from Chapman that he thinks leaving and slamming the door might be a better alternative to staying and trying to keep the blow up going. Now it's not ideal, obviously I, in, in an ideal world, I would be able to say, hold on, let's put the brakes on. I need a break from this. So I'm going to leave and let's talk about this when we both calm down a little bit, or at least when I calm down a little bit, maybe you're calm enough right now, but I'm definitely not. So I got to go. If you're incapable of that, what's a better option? Storming out or sticking around and trying to continue the litigation when you're activated? I, I don't know. I, for me, my vote is for storming out by far because clearly what you're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. And if you're at the point of where you feel like you want to storm out, so that means your fight or flight is we're super elevated, right? You don't do anything physically to relieve that feeling. It's going to come out in some, probably some really bad things coming out of your mouth and could lead to throwing things, physical altercations yeah. because you need to get that energy out or you're, you've got that urge to get the energy out by walking around, by leaving and walking around. Even if you're not communicating, that's what you're doing and that you're coming back or, or what it, I still think that's a better move. Just exert that energy in a way where you're not going to hurt anybody else because you're leaving and you're, you're walking, you're getting it out by taking that walk. Not ideal. And I've been there too, where I have not said anything. I've just walked away and it drove the other person crazy. And like, you can't leave them. And it's just like, eventually I got to the point of saying, I'm going to come back. But it, it was not easy for me to get there because I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of all this great information at the time. And so sometimes, yeah, it, it's just a little bit, one of those, ideally it'd be like, I need a break. We'll come back to this yeah, at some point, but I need a break right now. Give me a couple minutes and then walk out. And like if you can. And here's a weird thing. Uh, depending on the exact nature of your insecure attachment, one of two things is going to be harder for you. It's going to be harder for you to be the one that initiates the break, or it's going to be harder for you to accept the other person initiating the break and not chasing after them. And what he says here is if they walk out of the room, if you walk out of the room and you get followed, then you got to walk out the front door. And if you walk out the front door and you get followed, you got to walk around the block where it's, yeah, sometimes you could be with a partner who. Like your first attempt to walk away from the argument or the blow up is not going to be successful and you need to be ready to keep on walking. Yeah. I, and, and the only way that this works really is if you have the conversation when you're not in the middle of a fight. I was just about to say that. Here's how this could look in some situations. Here's how I could be reacting. And here's how I think we should both handle this when we're in the middle of it. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's, I think really important. He talks about that as one of the other steps where like that you're going to agree to seek a resolution. So right. I think knowing that is part of the whole process here that you're laying out, it's going to be easier for that the person to realize, okay, when that person walks away, it doesn't mean you are giving up on the relationship or the conversation or right. anything else like that. Where I would often go straight to. Me too. Yeah. Oh, oh it's over. Yeah, exactly. They, like, well, I would catastrophize every argument to, yeah, yeah, and every walking out of the room that you were done with me. And that's the thing is, if we're not communicating, that's an easy assumption to make. Where it's, yeah, it is, the best plan is to have a conversation when you're not fighting to say, listen, if things get heated, yeah, one of us is going to walk away from this and the other one needs to let them and not lose their mind over. And, right, and... The advantage, the other advantage of that is even if you can't communicate that at the time, at least by laying this out in advance, their assumption might be, okay, it's not absolutely he's never coming back. There could be a chance he's never coming back, but it could also be a chance he's going to come back and, and it will in, in his own time and work on this resolution because we laid it out as this is. The yeah. And it's not bad. You could even have the conversation to say, listen, if we, 
if this relationship ever ends and we ever break up, it's not going to break up by me storming off in the middle of an argument and never talking to you again. Oh, that's, yeah, that's great. That's never going to be, if this ends, that's never going to be the way that it ends. It's sad though. I think a lot of us think, oh, we don't need to communicate that. That's gotta be obvious based on the way we're behaving. But I think it's better to, oh, we've got so many of us have feed us that went out feed back of smokes and never came back. So of course we're going to feel like that's a possibility that's on the table, right? Sure. Yeah. Which is crazy, but if, yeah, you don't know. We have to have that conversation. And it doesn't even, it could be anybody. It could be, it could have been a previous partner and not even their parents, but it could have been a previous partner who right. did that. Exactly. Way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And now you're sensitive to that. All right. Key number four, agree to seek an explanation before passing judgment. The way I put this is assume that when your partner does something and you're angry about it, assume, you know, somewhere between 1% and 99% of the story. So it's not 0%. You're not completely 100%. Your perceptions are not completely 100% in the wrong. That You have not come to a completely unrational, unreasonable conclusion that has no basis in fact. It's got some basis in fact, but it's going to be between 1% and 99%. You're not, a, you're not 0% right and you're not 100% right. You're somewhere in the middle and the only cure for that is more information. Here's something to think about that just occurred to me is in this situation when you're getting information about something that made you angry, you will never have a hundred percent unless you were literally there when this thing happened and, and, and in their head, which is freaking possible, you're never going to know. And a perfect example is look at social media where people post just like the highlight reel a lot of times of sure their day or some, they, they go the opposite, the worst day of their life. And they're complaining about that. You don't see all the in between. You don't see that they re retook this video, this picture like five or six times, right? You don't have all 100% of the information and we seem to understand that, but yet we immediately go, oh, I have the whole story and I'm going to make my judgments based on the limited information I have. So usually the longer you wait, the, the more accurate you're going to be, the better chance you're going to have of getting it right and reacting the way you want to react to. Right. And the other thing is, um, this is where, you know, rhetorical techniques like steel manning come into the mix where you can say to your partner in this effort to get more information from them, you can say, okay, Dan, so here's where I think we are. As I understand it, you chose to do this because you felt this way and you thought the end result would be this. Is that correct? And then you say, yes, Charles, you, that is a good summary of where I was at, what I was feeling and what I was thinking. You've got it. And then I get to say, okay, based on us being on the same page about your actions, I'm still angry and here's why. And then what are you going to say? You, say? you don't get to feel angry. No, we both already agreed mm -hmm. that we're on the same page about what you were doing, why you did it, what right. you thought the result was going to be. Yeah. And even though we're on the same page, I still feel bad about it. Okay. Now we can work for, we can move forward with addressing my feelings because we both agree that I'm being reasonable and rational about this. And I'm agreeing that you are too. And okay, we agree with where you were when this happened. And now I still have these negative feelings that I'm dealing with. And if you care about me, your reaction is going to be, okay, what can we do about that? Yeah. 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 No, I think that's you. That's really important is being on the same page with as much as possible with the situation. And that's how you do it. You say, Hey, look, am I interpreting the situation? correctly in your eyes and your mind by laying it out that way. Yeah. So if you don't have the same thing with like language, if we can't agree on what a word means, we can't have a conversation exactly. about it. Right. Exactly. Same situation. Yep. All right. Let's see what the, oh, the next one, number five is agree to seek a resolution. So yeah, part of it has to be, okay, we have acknowledged up until this point where we are, we, we, both of us have gotten to offer our explanation. And in this case, we both can at least see where the other person's coming from and we understand what the other person's feeling. Now, are we going to do something to fix this or are we going to just say, okay, this is unresolvable and nothing good can come of us continuing to discuss this. And I would say, if this is a relationship that you want to continue, you're going to say, all right, what can we do to make this better? And what can we do to avoid this exact same problem or something very close to it in the future? Yeah, I think this is a good opportunity to remember to work on a solution and not on a winner for right this exactly the argument you and me versus the problem not me versus so get into brainstorming mode and try to think of all the possible ways you could resolve this and i think 
by doing that kind of helps you set your ego aside a little bit and yeah there's always going to be somebody who's more wrong than the other person or so and the other key thing there is to be honest about what resolutions you're willing to accept and follow through on and which ones you're not because if it's hey hey honey i'm angry at you because the way you interact with this one coworker leads to me so i need you to go ahead and quit that job and go work somewhere else and the answer to that might be, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, yeah. What other, what other potential resolutions can we explore? Because I'm not going to quit my job and go work someplace else. Yeah. And so that's when you've got to be willing to say, okay, that's one potential resolution, but it's not the one that I'm willing to entertain. So let's keep brainstorming. Because <laughs> what, what you can't do is say, yes, I'm willing to fix the problem in the way that you want it fixed and then not deliver on that fix that you agree to. Yeah. So don't ever agree to a resolution that you're not willing to actually implement and follow through on. And then finally, agree to affirm your love for each other. And that reminds me of what Corey Wayne says in How to Become a 3% Man, which is when it comes to a man having a conversation like this with a woman, the conversation is not over until you hear something along the lines of, thanks for hearing me. I'm so glad we talk. I'm so glad we could work this out. If you're not hearing something like that from her, regardless of whether it was you who brought the issue up to her or she who brought it to you. The end result that tells you that she feels good about where you are now is her usually voicing some acknowledgement of, mm -hmm. I'm so glad we talked, we had this conversation, we worked it out, whatever. Yeah. If you haven't heard that, then there's a good possibility that she's not happy where things currently are and there's more work to get done. Yeah. It's a good opportunity to ask, hey, tell me more. Is there, what, what else is going on? Let's... Yeah, and you can even dig in a little. Yeah. Are you glad we talked? Are you glad we brought this up? Do you feel like we got to a resolution or do you think we have some more work to do? What questions do you still have? Yeah. And or doubts. What doubts? And you have to assume have? that when you ask those questions, she's going to answer you honestly yeah. because you have to. I think it's important also to, to phrase things in the right way. So I know when I'm interviewing customers for uh, issues, you know, troubleshooting their issues. I don't ask, do you have more questions? I say, what questions do you have? And that I think I've gotten, I've, I've, I feel like I've gotten more information out of people by asking it in that way rather than just going, oh no, I don't have anything else. Exactly. Yeah. Saying, I'm just assuming you do have more. Exactly. It's very easy to set people up to make the easy answer. Yes, I'm done. Where you don't want the easy answer to be, yes, I'm done. You want the easy answer to be, no, we're not done yet. Because then you'll get that additional information that, that you, that they may not know they need to offer and you might not know you need, but you, yeah, you want the default to be, how can I make this as easy as possible for you to tell me that we still need to keep talking? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So though, look, as guys, it's, we look at so many conversations like a race where the faster you get to the end, the more successful you are. And that, that's not. This is the work guys. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When, when you talk about, I'm willing to work on the relationship. This is the stuff we're talking about. Yeah. Not I'm willing to listen to an audio book in my car. That's the easy part. But the the results you want are at the end of the work you don't want to do so mm -hmm. much of the time. Mm -hmm. And so these keeping these conversations going is, is often the thing. Uh, I like he has this idea with the index card. Yeah. I like that too. Which is essentially like a, a yellow or a red card in soccer where, okay, something has just happened that is worth stopping the action over. And so I'm going to hold this card up and I'm going to read it to you. And we're going to let this determine the course of where we go next instead of the, let's just roll over this and act like it didn't happen or react to it in the way that we're most comfortable. Yeah. So what he says to do is to write down, I'm feeling angry right now, but don't worry. I'm not going to attack you. I need your help. Is this a good time to talk? Don't ask the question, is this a good time to talk? If in your own head, you know, it's not a good time to talk. Only take this out when you're ready. Modify it as you need. So yeah. it might be one of those where the first card is, I'm angry right now. I need a few minutes. I We will come back to this and talk about it. I'm not letting it go. So that might be the, the way. Yeah. And you don't even need to say it. Maybe you just pass the card across the table to the person to, to your, your signal other and say, and then walk out. Yeah. So you're at least communicating the same that. way we said, yeah. leaving and slamming the door is better than continuing to stay in the room and have your blow up sliding this card across the table is better than leaving and slamming the door and just try to use the most healthy and effective method that you have availability to call on in the moment. And my suggestion is maybe trim it down to the wallet size card. You can keep it with yeah. it. like a credit card <laughs> size. That's keep it with you at restaurants and stuff if you have to. Uh, that's where if the one, you know, one Vista parade, just have 500 of these cards created. 
the, the, if she's activated, she can ball it up and throw it away and you don't have to write out a brand hey, to us. And you know what? I'm hearing our first Mindfully ma- Masculine branded product here. We could make a little set of cards. With our QR code and our little logo on it. Oh, oh, yeah. And just slide it across the tab. Emotion management cards. Yeah, exactly. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Anger is not inherently bad. Getting angry over things that are unfair or unjust is what makes the world a better place. And let's not make the emotion of anger the scapegoat or the villain in the situation. It's just you get to choose whether to address it in healthy ways or unhealthy ways, loving ways or unloving ways. But you're in a throuple with your partner in anger. It's just the way it is. Anger is going to be part of this relationship. Can't get rid of your emotions. No. And the more effort you take to hide your emotions or pretend like they're not there, the choice is, am I going to have, am I going to frequently address my anger and let it play a role in my emotional life? Or am I going to try to tamp it down as much as I can, as often as I can, so that it only comes out in nuclear explosions every X number of months or years? Yeah. Do you want to control it? On the way out, or do you, you, or do you want it to, yeah, basically take over to the point of where, yeah, it's completely uncontrolled, and then it does a lot more damage than you actually getting that lasso out. Your partner can handle your anger when you bring it to them in a healthy and beneficial way. They're, it's not your anger that they're afraid of, or your anger that breaks them down. It's your unhealthy reactions by letting it just run out of control. Yeah. Think of it like a a dog who hasn't been disciplined, right? You bring that dog out and you've got, it's on a leash and maybe it's got a muzzle. It's controlled, right? You, it's, it, people feel a lot safer around something yeah, like yeah. that than a dog who just escapes from the house and hasn't been, yeah. hasn't been taught behave. Yeah. Very well. Very few people are bummed out or afraid of well-behaved dogs. It's only the unmanaged, undisciplined dogs yeah. that are the ones that people don't want to be around and get afraid of with obviously very small number of exceptions, but that's generally how, how yeah. it works. Yeah. A dog who knows how to behave in public is a joy to be around. Yeah. And one that doesn't is a hassle. And I think, I your, think your anger is the same way. Yeah. People, it's just more obvious to people when it comes to dogs that you need to put some time and effort into training them, managing them and controlling them so that they are able to be exist in the world and not cause damage, I guess, is the best way to put it, right? Why not our emotions? Yeah. And let's give anger credit. The reason that non-property owners and women and racial minorities have rights today is because somebody got angry about the status quo at some point. And they, obviously there were, there were mishits and there were ways that it went well, ways that it didn't go well, but the ultimate positive result that we had was born out of somebody's anger of an unfair situation. It's a great source of motivation. Yeah, absolutely. And so you can do some great things with it. Your anger is not your problem. Your unregulated emotions are the problem. And so just the easy answer is not get rid of the anger. It's learn to regulate your emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's where we'll leave for today. The next chapter, which I thought was coming sooner. I thought we were going to cover this today, but the art of apologizing will be chapter 10 that we will get into next time. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And is that our final chapter or do we have one more? After that, we have frequently asked questions. Okay. And then after that, we have a 30 question uh, quiz to help men figure out what their love language is. Yeah. Got a couple more episodes to go and then we'll figure out what book we're attacking after that. Hopefully not attacking. Hopefully we can find one that we can pleasantly review, but who knows? Odds are it'll be one that I'm going to attack. Thanks, Dan. We will chat with you next time. All right. Talk soon. Yep. Wow, you made it through the whole thing, so you must like us at least a little bit, in which case you should definitely follow or subscribe to our show in your chosen podcast app. Thanks. We'll talk to you next time.